Hello and welcome to another edition of Talkin' Tunes. I am your host, Frank Walsh. And ladies and gentlemen, this gentleman to my right here has been on our show and you probably remember him for his great music, his terrific voice, his dry wit, and a little bit of sarcasm. Now hopefully he can bring that again today for you. And I do have to add something else. This is my 100th show. And for the longest time, I had been planning to have someone with talent, someone who is good, someone who was going to blow you away. And unfortunately, I couldn't find anybody. So Chuck was available and I said, what the heck? Let's bring him in for the 100th show. And he knows that I am only kidding and he knows that I love this guy. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Chuck Vermette. Chucky, can you live up to that horrible introduction? I can live up to you. I can. Now I have to learn to aim higher in life. I'll tell you, that will get you up to your ankles if you want to get higher than me. How the heck have you been, Chucky? It's been good, Frank. Yeah. It's been good. I'm playing out a lot, which is, you know, you, everybody builds a career one notch at a time. Well, your notches have been coming one after the other because you've been playing quite a bit and you have a lot going on. I do indeed. Um, this weekend, I have, um, I'm pleased to promote the uh, Catbird Cafe I'm featuring. Um, wonderful place. It's kind of to me what the Cavern Club was to the Beatles. It's yep. run by uh, Stephen Martin and Eric the Snake Gullickson, who are members of, who are members of Orpheus. Remember, can't Orpheus. find the time? Ba -da 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 -da. Nice guys, too. Very nice guys. Where is the Catbird Cafe? It is in the New England Wildlife Center, um, 500 Columbian Street, Weymouth. If you know where Lottery Headquarters is, yep. it's right there where Braintree and Weymouth meet. Exactly. I mean, I, I know where it is, and I just wanted the folks at home to know. And uh, this is not the first time you're going to be playing there. You play there on a regular basis. Yes. Yes, I've featured there before, and I get up there. It's, it feels like a home base to me. Yeah. I know that from uh, following you on Facebook that you've had a lot of different adventures going on. You've played at a lot of different places, and it seems like thing are, things are really coming along for you. You're getting into more places. You're playing more gigs. Is there a CD in the Chuck Vermet future? Um, yes, there is. What I'm, I'm taking a different track. I've come into online music. Basically, what I want to do is take four songs through them as best I can. It's always a concern, like, with any business, not that what I do is business, I consider it more of an avocation, but okay. where do you put your resources? Okay. You know, unfortunately there are, you know, are many people that, good people, they spend, you know, five to $15,000 and up on a CD, yep. but then the aftermarket, what you do with it, well, it becomes a challenge. Mm -hmm. I decide not to go that route. You take four of my more tested songs, do them as well as I can, as best I can with the resources I can, and promote those, mostly on online sales. Kind of like the old uh, vinyl days when they put out the exactly. EP, you know? Exactly. They just put out the little EP. Exactly. Well, good for you. Do you have, um, you know, a place lined up? You're going to do it yourself and, and, you know, record yourself, or are you going to look into a studio or what? I have not taken it that far. Okay. I do have plenty online that I've done, mm -hmm. and again, co cost-benefit, Right. You know, it's, it's ironic that actually in terms of fidelity and being an audio, audiophiles, the, um, the new world of iTunes, somewhat it does, it's not as mission critical as it can be and some people mm -hmm. lament that and there are some things to lament. Mm -hmm. There are whole different concerns in recording today than when I first did it 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. We had the big four tracks, you tended to have more fidelity. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's all kind of things you can do where you can treat a music file like a word file and cut this and move this. Again, you could do that 40 years ago if you wanted to splice, right. splice tape. Right. In many ways, it's the same, mm -hmm. but in many ways, it's different. Have you been doing any uh, writing since the last time? You know, written any new songs? Because the last time you were on, you were playing uh, mostly originals, I believe, the last time you were here. And have you written any new songs? You know, to tell you the truth, I have not in okay. the last year. They tend to come in bunches. Yep. I don't know why that is. I could stand to be more disciplined, but most of my effort, ironically, I've been doing is what we call woodshedding. Okay. Practicing. I just got a wonderful teacher. I can't recommend him 
Highly enough, John Finn of Whitman, he's a senior Berkeley professor, he's a principal guitarist at the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Um, incredible musician and incredible teacher in the sense he does what the best teachers do. Discerns the direction you need to go in and explain thing, explains things in a light where many of the things he said are not new, but he makes me look at things in a way I've never looked at them before, which mm -hmm. is what good teaching does. Cool. Now, how easy is it to take what he gives you and translate into your 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 thought process and your your fingers, et cetera? Is that an easy transition? Does it just kind of flow through you, or is it mechanical? It is mechanical, and as I remember him saying once, and I appreciate it, learning is messy. Okay. It is messy, and frequently, and I think most performers or anybody who tries to take any skill is really no different at one time or another. I've studied karate, I've studied singing, I've studied guitar and other things. And so you failed at other things other than music? Absolutely. Oh, okay, just checking. Yeah, it's why I um, can't I We can't know find each other, a, folks. These are inside yeah. jokes. Yeah, I can't find a better level of people to hang around with than this guy. That tells everybody everything I need to know. I tell you, you know, anybody who would have me as a club member, I wouldn't want to join. Well, you know, we were both getting nervous when the uh, cops walked in and saw our picture up on the post office, so... Well, that's why I'm not on Facebook because I'm um, in the witness protection program. You know, little joke of mine that never gets any bigger. A very little joke. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, we had to get that in, Chuck. It wouldn't be us if we didn't do of that. Of course. Um, let's get back to uh, a little bit more sub a subject more more dear to your heart. Um, you know, your your influence, your your inspirations. You know, where your music comes from, and and some of those thought processes that goes into the music that differentiates you from other musicians. Because you and I have had conversations about how do we put you in a box? How do you classify my music? You know, where do I belong? And at the end of the day, you kind of say, ah, the heck with it all. I'm just going to be who I am. And if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. You know. So has anything changed over, you know, the, since the time we had that initial conversation a year or so ago about that? Or do you still feel that way? I feel the same way evolved, which I think anybody, I forget who said it, but someone once said, if you haven't changed a major idea of yours in two years, it's time to look at yourself. Okay. I would not say in terms of fitting in a box, I sometimes wonder, and I guess for lack of a better word, it's a good problem. Yeah, there it are is. people who have suggested problem, I go yeah. in, in different directions. So one of the things I've been doing cabaret, and uh, some people think I should go in that direction. You have the pipes for it. Thank you. I know what I like to do. I guess if I had to put in one sense, I was very influenced by Bob Dylan, and I would like to take that tradition and put something, I don't say more musical, but Dylan was very itinerant and is very itinerant, and there's a, a place for that. I basically consider him, somebody called him the first mass media poet, I think it was Tony Studuto. Makes sense. In his, in his biography. But taking that and the other influences, I've always liked a lot of music. One thing that I have always tried to emulate is the Beatles, where they could do anything from Eleanor Rigby to Helter Skelter and everything in between. Yeah. What do you say you want to do? You want to just stand up and do paperback writer? Is that the yes, one that all things kind being of equal? Yeah, it's that, like when right? we go to the banner, hey, let's do paperback writer. Yeah, you know, and I was going to get to that, and I think that was the piggyback of my initial question. It was because when I first, you know, got to know you and heard your music and everything, it, you know, great stuff, but again, a little different, you know, a little out of the box, which is a compliment. But I've seen you with the clubs, I've seen you with the jams, I've seen you play where you can get up there and play Santana, you can play the Beatles, you can get up there and jam with the best of them. So I was wondering if that pendulum had swung from sticking to that, you know, Chuck Vermette style, playing, you know, your own music, writing your own music, or is that pendulum swinging so that you're out there playing more covers, playing more jams and doing more things because I don't have a chance to hear you do your originals in uh, the places where I associate with you. Well, and part of that, and I owe this directly to you, is exposing me to that kind of, like when we, the banner and rock when we wow. get together at that and I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you, man. You should. Thank you. Um, working with live musicians. Yeah. And that, that 
for uh, that you know feedback, the interaction. Well, those are great people down there. I know you you're very fond of Skip Fisher. You yes, know, Skip Fisher has been on the show, and, and Brandon, Peter. Yes, you know Brandon uh, Fletcher, Pete Comerford, Della Erskine, Wednesday Night Jams, Banner Pub. Get there if you haven't been there. This guy plays there a lot. Great food, great music, great time. Uh, Skip Fisher is a a marvelous musician, drummer, as good as you will yeah. find. And again, something that John and Skip have in common, they're very humble, self-effacing people they until are. they start talking about what they've done, which they will only do with. But Skip is one of the first time I played with them, and this to me is a mark of a real musician, a whole different level. It was like we were communicating on our own wavelength. Absol All I had absolutely. to do was look at him and say, okay, I'm going to start doing triplet triplet quarter notes, and he just knew. We could yep. just look at each other yep. and he just, I'm going to cut out here, you know, and n literally nod my head, you know, okay, Skippy, I'm going to cut out here, I'm going to do a fill here, and he just felt it. Didn't yep. even have to say it, he just felt it. Cool. Well, you know, we're talking about your music. I think it's about time that uh, we get to hear a little bit of your music. Certainly. And, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to get some very good video of you playing at a concert down in the South Shore somewhere. So why don't you just do a quick little intro about um, Certainly. This, this clip. World Music Day was an event, again, just that worldwide yep. to um, emphasize the power of music. Yep. And um, again, another performer named Colette O'Connor invited me to participate. And this was down in the Cape, um, Cape Cod Media Center in Dent Dennis, and it was a, a telethon, an all-day event. And this was clips from it. Cool. Well, our esteemed director, if you have that clip ready, let's hear Chuck Vermet doing his thing. Tell her again, tell her again, tell her that you love her, tell her again, the fire leaps high. On a soft chin to wind Tell her that you love her Tell her again Perhaps it's a weakness And shouldn't be so But we need to hear What we already know Tell her again Tell her Again. Tell her that you love her, tell her again A tree in a storm breaks or it bends Tell her that you love her, tell her again Perhaps you've forgotten, here's what to say you can't remember when it wasn't that way. Tell her again. Tell her again. Nicely done. I always love your music when you get into some of those tender songs versus some of the ones where you really let rip. But um, I understand you have a little interesting story or a tidbit that you want to share about that song? First of all, it came into me literally when I woke up in the morning, almost in whole cloth. And I guess it's, a, it's something about the creative process because I remember I sang a couple of uh, bars to my lovely, long suffering wife, who you met, Teresa. Teresa, lovely woman. And she said, get 
your recorder. Get your phone, sing this, get the nucleus of it. Now, interestingly enough, um, another influence, another show I'm doing, uh, Sandy Street, who does AT. Sandy w Stride, sure. Sandy Stride. Sandy Stride, W A T D 95.9, yep. Yes, Twilight Showcase. Twilight Showcase, yep. Well, um, I was going to do Sandy's show, and I, I was on a cell phone call, and I played some of it, and she says, it's great, it needs a couple of lines. And that's where the craft comes in. Because I realized that, yes, say, it's right, there was too much chorus, and the, it, it needed a little bit more glue to tie it together. And the, um, again, the lines about a tree in a storm and the fire leaps high just came literally right away. And I just. Beautiful, Eric. Great visual. And I, I just, Sandy, this is what I came up with. And she said, wow, it's great. That was quick, but that's part of the process. It wasn't all inspiration. Well, well there's a little similarity between uh, your style a little bit and, and the uniqueness of your music with her husband there, who also plays with her. Um, oh. Is that her husband? I'm assuming it's her husband. Yes, Keith. Keith, Keith James. Keith and James. And I like I like what Keith I does. I love his music. I love his music, and uh, you know I can see some parallels with y your music and his, and that you know you're both different. You don't sing traditional songs, and you know you both have very strong messages oftentimes behind your songs that makes you think. At least Keith, you know yours certainly does, but you know Keith's has some wonderful songs. He's got a wonderful song that, again, I had seen this. It's called um, Last Chance for an Eternity, that is very ethereal. Yep. Has a message, and I happen. As a matter of fact, I believe it's there. I'm, I'm sorry, Frank, I forget the term when you, have a, when you have a song that ends the show when you fade out on the end. Right, right, okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it, he uses it. I think it it's his... called Ending the Show and Fading Out. Oh, it's called Ending the I Show think and so, Fading yeah. Out. I think that's the technical term. Oh, given uh, our age, I'm. Uh, Fading out is kind yeah, of a exactly. sensitive term. I've got a birthday coming up in two weeks. I know. Black arm band. I'm with you. I'm with you. But yeah, Keith is great. I like the one that he does, um, the one, I, I forget the exact title, but the one where repetition, everything repeats itself and doing it over and over again. You should check that out. It's, oh, pretty, it's sure. pretty cool. And then some of his patriotic songs and his message songs. He's yes. got some great patriotic songs and tribute songs. Was, was it... Was it Keith that did the song about the Mayflower? The I Mayflower believe so. Too? Yes. Yes. Yes, he did. That was a, a big part of the pl recent celebration, yeah. Plymouth. Cool. Now, um, we were talking a little bit off the year, and as you know, time flies on this, is that one of the things that you had, had mentioned to me is that you don't like people to ask you what a song means or you know, what, what that song's about. Uh, is that true? Yes, it is true. And Why is that? A couple reasons. One is just an artistic outlook that I learned from my days as an English literature. It's called formless criticism, which ultimately it doesn't matter what you may have intended with a work. What matters is the meaning that goes into it. Two, for the same reason, a listener puts their own images, their own perceptions on something. Correct. And if I say what it means to me, I take away from that. Think of it. Okay. I don't think there is. I certainly, with me and from what I've heard, um, you know, 49 out of 50 people, they never like the movie version of a book as much as the book itself. Okay. For instance, you know what a fan I am of Ian Rand's Atlas Shrugged. I absolutely detest the movie. And I think that's part of that. It's the same way in a movie, you know, it takes away, oh, I see the character like this, or, oh, they cut the funniest part out of this. And I would not want to do that, and I feel I do that if I say what a song. And there's a third meaning that perhaps I, do, I don't know what song is coming up next, but one of the songs that is on this video, you know, the Bellevue Rag, and of it's course, something I wrote when I was 19. And I realize what it means to me now and what it says to me now is something completely different okay. than what I would have thought when I was 19. But when I'm actually listening to it, I was saying something entirely different. As a matter of fact, I think if more to my core than I realized when I was 19. Okay. And I'm since, um, you know, I may... I may break my code and explain it ever since, you know, I stiffed you on that, on that dinner <laughs> in the banner. And I, yeah, I did pay you back, but you I feel like I owe back. it to you. You so. still pay me back. 
But anyway, I mean, you know, I, I, I agree with your explanation, but as someone who appreciates music and really tries to get into the music and, and assimilate and, and understand meanings, there are songs that I cannot wrap my arms around and say, I don't know what he or she is trying to say. Now, I may know how I feel about a song. It may impact me emotionally. But I want to know sometimes what that means or what that person was saying in that song because it may round out things that I may not understand. So I might look at that in a totally different perspective, you know. And then there are some songs and there are some lyrics that are so out there and so, um, you know, esoteric or they're so, um, you know, metaphoric that you don't know what they mean. Like take American Pie, for example. We've talked about that in different shows. You take American Pie, Don McLean, right? He would never, until recently, ever explain what that song meant. And if you know the lyrics to that, it's kind of out there. But when you understand different interpretations of what that song is, you say, wow. It is like in your face. It's explaining what it means versus because there is no room for interpretation. If someone says to you, you know, in the jester and the joke, you sing, jester, who the heck is that? And the joker, well, that's Bob Dylan. Wow, Bob Dylan, I see that now. And it makes everything else fit into context. Or if someone is writing a beautiful love song and they put some simile or metaphor in there that I may not understand, I may feel that. But if I say, Chuck, what does that mean? And you say, oh, I was talking about, you know, the love for my wife and, and you know, we're going to live forever. And I'd say, wow. I have three approaches to that. Okay. One of them is simply something John Lennon said. There's a scene in Imagine where somebody is literally camping out in his backyard. Yeah. And he invites him to the door and he's partly unnerved. Well, he should be. And what he says to this person is that I play with words. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm reflecting on what you're thinking, Frank. What you're saying is very valid. Mm -hmm. But in terms of who is the Joker in American Pie, I can see other interpretations of that. Right. I don't want McLean telling me what he thought. Well, he wouldn't tell you. But there's, there's another more sardonic reason, is that the artist failed. There's a saying, for instance, in marketing, that if I have to explain a logo or a concept to yeah, you, the, the I failed. The product is worthless, right. right. But, you know, but his standard answer was, and I always love it. I mean, there are great, great things that have stayed in my head forever, and this is one of them. Someone said to me, hey, Don, uh, you know, what is the meaning of American Pie? And without missing a beat, he said, it means that I never have to work another day in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and that was his standard answer. But, you know, I, I did a lot of research and I, I did my own assimilations and I did my own, you know, connections of that. Some of, w of which I was right and others that I was way off. Because some of the obvious similes and metaphors are obvious. Obvious, so I just redundant. We had a thing on redundancy the other day, so let's do it again and try not to be redundant. We're going to try not to be redundant? Yeah. I think we already again failed and, and we've redundant. been redundant. We've been redundant again? Do I have to repeat myself? Yes, we've yeah, been redundant. Yeah, well, we should stop being redundant and be redundant. I we get into our own inside jokes and story. I told you we were going to go off the track a little bit. But, uh, Chuck, I think we have maybe a, a, a time for maybe one more song. We could probably talk for an hour, but I think the people would rather hear you sing than listen to us banter. So if there is a clip ready to go, let's hear Chuck from it. Thank you so much. I love to find out how people meet. You know, how did you meet each other? Well, here's a song about two people who meet under very special circumstances. It's called the Bellevue Rag. Just been strapped down to the bed when you walked in the room. Even though straight jacketed you wiped away my gloom. But you are an outpatient while I'm in intensive care. If you just have a breakdown, then a lifetime we could share. I 
think it's love at first sight, though you're only a neurotic. There's something when I look at you that's helpfully erotic. But if you want to dance with me, you've got to be psychotic to do the Bellevue Rag. You've got a pill that just won't quit while I am photogenic. But you with just a phobia while I am schizophrenic. Pretend that you're a paranoid who's prone to argue panic. We'll do the Bellevue Rag. Well, my roommate's a rat, except he thinks he's Genghis Khan. I will get him transferred and then we can get it on. And when you start delusions and hallucinating, you can move in with me, we'll start copulating. I know that things could be much worse. You could have halitosis, leprosy, leukemia, or cystic fibrosis. I will bribe a doctor to say that you have psychosis. We'll do the Bellevue rag. And then we'll write our comb. My dearest Uncle Harry, he'll get a court injunction so the two of us can marry. Cause if it don't, I'll tell his wife about his secretary. Do him the Bellevue rag. Personality will make your life such fun. Last week I was Franklin, now this week I'm Jefferson. When you're schizo, you are anyone you wanna be. So you be Cleopatra and I will be Mark Antony. I know that things could be much worse. You could have halitosis, leprosy, leukemia, or cystic fibrosis. I will bribe a doctor to say that you've a psychosis. We'll do the Bellevue rag. Thank you. Once again, Chuck, Thank I'm you, very pleased uh, that they uh, let you out of Bellevue to appear on this show today. You know, uh, good stuff. But as always, Chuck, time is our enemy. And there are so many things that we could talk about for more. But I think we only have about enough time to, uh, in a serious note, thank you. You've always been a good friend to me. You're welcome on this show anytime. Congratulations on 100, Frank. Thank you, and I, I really appreciate that. You're welcome here anytime. And um, Roxanne Morris, Michael Hammond, who pushed the buttons today, thank you very much. Folks, go out and support your local musicians. And for Chuck Vermette, I am Frank Walsh. And as always, tune in and tune on. That was good. <laughs>